If you've ever spent much time on skis, there's a very important truth you've probably realized. No matter how good your equipment is, no matter how fast you are, how many tricks you can do, you're not going to be a very good skier unless you know how to turn. Because even on the straight and wide runs, if you don't know how to turn, you're going to eventually meet one of three things. A tree, a stranger, or a fence. And that meeting will not be pleasant. You may find yourself drifting and heading for the forest. You may find a large group of slow moving people just cosmically ending up in your path. Uh, and, and anyway, turning slows you down. So if you're lined up perfectly and nobody is in your way, if you don't turn, you're going to hit the end of that run at the speed of sound. You go flying through the parking lot, bouncing off the vehicles and ending up flat on your back, looking at the clouds floating peacefully through the sky above you. You need to learn how to turn. Whether you're exploring or simply slowing down and avoiding a painful death, turning is one of the absolute most important skills to learn in order to become a successful skier. Now, David found this out after he killed Goliath. His life changed immediately. No longer was he a shepherd boy playing a harp and protecting the sheep. Suddenly, David was the most famous person in Israel. He became a leader in the army, and every mission he went on was a huge success. He married Princess Michael, and she put up with him, even though the Bible says that all the women came out from all the towns in Israel to meet King Saul in the army with singing and dancing, singing, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul liked the song at first, until they sang the second verse, and then he wasn't sure anymore. In fact, Saul began to keep a careful eye on David because he realized the people loved David more than they loved him because David had been brave and he trusted God and won the victory while Saul had hid in his tent and tried to look busy. This would have been a perfect time for David to seize the kingdom from Saul. It, he was a successful general. He was the hero of the nation. And it wouldn't have been hard at all to kill Saul, claim the throne, and become the king. And David knew that God planned for him to be king because the prophet Samuel had anointed him and told him so. So on the surface, David would have been completely in his right to kill Saul and take the throne, the straightest, fastest route down the mountain. But he didn't. Instead of bombing straight down the ski hill, David turned. Now David was flying down the mountain at full speed, everything going perfectly when all of a sudden something happened. Something got into his way and it was this. King Saul had been troubled for a long time when David began to get more and more popular. Uh, and Saul began to get jealous and to look for a way to get rid of him. And when David and his daughter Michael fell in love and wanted to get married, King Saul came up with a genius plan. In those days, to get married, you had to pay a large price to your bride's family, both as a way to prove that you were well off enough to take care, take care of her, as well as to help replace some of the wealth that she would have provided for her parents' family. And being a princess, Saul knew that Michael should have a very, very high price. A price that might just get rid of David once and for all. Saul decided that the price for Michael would be 100 very specific pieces of skin from the enemies, the Philistines. He figured that there was no way David could manage this without getting himself killed because the Philistines really preferred to keep the skin on their bodies. When David heard this, Instead of being alarmed, he, he was thrilled because this was a price that he could pay. And just to show how eager he was, he didn't just collect 100 very specific pieces of skin from the Philistines, he collected 200. And so King Saul had to let his daughter marry David. His plan had failed. So he came up with a new one. He told all his servants to kill David. Now, fortunately, Prince Jonathan, David's best friend, managed to talk his dad out of this order, but eventually things just got so bad to the point where David had to run away. But this wasn't David's only curve. Just like on the ski run, David had to keep on carving back and forth, back and forth. And after he ran away, people began to come to him. People who'd been mistreated by King Saul, people on the run, people who didn't like where the country was headed. It wasn't long before David had a band of outlaws surrounding him, a rebel army who always seemed to be saving Israelite towns in the nick of time. And so what ended up happening was to the Israelites, he became a sort of a folk hero, uh, almost a Robin Hood type of guy. And he began to gain more and more support from the Israelites, while their actual king, Saul, began to lose more and more support. 
Now, this didn't help Saul's jealousy issue, and he began to chase David. It was like a massive, high-stakes game of hide-and-seek. Now, Saul and his army would search for David, and instead of fighting back, David and his army would run away and hide somewhere. In fact, some of David's most impressive turns came when Saul was insanely close. One time, King Saul got some intelligence reports that David and his men were in the desert of En Gedi, near the crags of the wild goats. And so he took 3,000 soldiers to check it out. Now the Bible says that when he came to the sheep pens along the way, there was a cave there and Saul decided to go in for a little pit stop. Now this was a horrible plan because the cave that King Saul chose happened to be the very cave that David and his entire band of merry men had chosen to hide themselves in. And once again, David had a perfect chance to kill Saul and seize the throne. Now David's men couldn't believe their good fortune. And they saw Saul coming in alone. And they said, this is your chance, David. God has given you the throne. Now go and take it. And so while King Saul was getting relief, David snuck up behind him in the dark. And he turned. See, at this second, David could have, you know, tucked and bombed all the way down to the ski lodge in one quick run, but he turned. He realized that if he really, really trusted God, then he would let God make him king in God's own time. He had watched as God had worked in his life up until this point, protecting him, providing for him, blessing him, and so he let God take the lead, and he turned. As he knelt there behind Saul, dagger out, ready to strike, he lowered it quietly, and he cut off a corner of Saul's robe, and he carefully snuck back to his waiting men. Now Saul finished what he was doing, he stood up, he left, and the Bible says that even just cutting off a corner of Saul's robe just wrecked David's conscience to the point where after Saul left the cave, David ran after him and apologized, bowing to the ground. What? Wait, what kind of rebel was this? Instead of killing his enemy, he bows and pays him respect? It makes no sense. Uh, that thing wouldn't work in our own lives, would it? What, what if we actually trusted our future, our entire future, to God and then let him run it? Would that actually work? See, David trusted his whole life to God, and that didn't make it an easy life. Uh, we've seen today just a few of the things that he faced, but he didn't win every battle against the Philistines or against himself. So what was the point anyway? The point was that David walked with God. In skiing terms, he stayed flexible, turning and carving with the path ahead of him instead of forcing his way down that hill in a straight line that he may have wanted to take. There were challenges, but always David kept riding that terrain that God gave him. He had this thing called faith. Now, faith is just a fancy word for trust. The Bible defines it in Hebrews 11 by saying that it is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. It's, it's like looking at a map. You know, if I'm going on a road trip to a place I've never been before, I can look at a map and see that if I take 97 to Dawson, then 2 to Alberta till it becomes 43, turn left on to 16 in Edmonton, follow it till you hit Fort Francis, Right on 53 to Chippewa Falls, left on 94, I'll eventually end up in Green Bay, Wisconsin for the next Packers game. And I believe it. I've never driven that road. I've never even been on most of those highways. But because the map tells me those roads will get me to Green Bay, I believe it. I have no idea what that trip will be like or what experiences I'll have along the way. But I have full confidence that if I just keep following my map, my destination will be sure. And instead of wondering if I'll make it, I might as well just go and buy the tickets right now. It's the same with God. I have no idea what my life will look like if I choose to follow God, but I can be completely confident of two things. One, if I let God lead, my destination will be heaven, 100%. And two, God will walk beside me all the way. I'll never be alone. And with these two absolute promises, I have more than enough to convince me to take that risk, to follow the map, turn by turn, with no way of knowing the exact details. So today I want to challenge you to follow God. Turn when he asks you to turn, even if you just want to keep bombing straight down that hill. Take that risk and know that you'll never be alone and your final destination is completely guaranteed. If you want this, pray with me now. God, I give you my life. I give you my future. Please walk with me all my days and help me to follow you. Amen.
This December, the Chetwin Communication Society made wonderful donations in the Peace Region. <laughs> Using our bingo funds, a total of $263,918 was donated to six organizations. And it gives me great pleasure to make this presentation. Yeah. No, thank you for what you do. I'd like to thank you for what you do in the community. It is great. Really good. You're more than welcome. Glad to be able to do it. Thank you for me and my team. Well, you're more than welcome, and it's uh, it's something that is much needed. And thanks for the service you do. Thank you. You're more than welcome. It's a great pleasure to be able to do this. We're also thrilled to be awarding $75,000 in bursaries to post-secondary students. None of this would have been possible without Leo Sobolski, all of our staff, our mascot, and more importantly, you, our amazing bingo players. We would like to wish everyone happy bingo days and... Merry Christmas! <laughs>
Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So when let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The Word of God for the people of God. So much of Christianity feels like life on repeat. The message doesn't change. The stories all point to the same redemptive crescendo, and even the teachings of Scripture are summed up by one writer as exhortation by way of reminder. This is Paul as the preacher and his continuing emphasis on love, genuine love, that he takes up again in today's text. The gospel, the good news of a Savior and freedom in him, leads to changes not only on the cosmic level, but even down to the individual and how they think and live. This is the gospel manifest in our lives. It extends to relationships and interactions with others. How do Christians relate to others? With love. It is a profound type of love lived out even toward our enemies, Paul says. Those radically changed by the good news of Jesus now experience transformed lives, and not only do we have a whole new group of people to call family, but love and care extends to those we would rarely imagine, to enemies and to the government even. Scripture implications really do go that far. They implore and empower us to pay all that is owed, taxes, revenue, respect, and honor. Romans 13, verse 7, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. All things that can be paid in full. And this leads us to give out what is owed, but can never be repaid. Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. Do not be in debt to anyone except this debt of love. We are always to be paying out love. This is a profound call to develop a deep horizontal love that can never be extinguished. Origen, a theologian from the second century, wrote, Paul desires that our debt of love should remain and never cease to be owed, for it is expedient that we should both pay this debt and always owe it. The Christian is always a love debtor, no matter how much love they give. Every time we meet someone, we ought to say to ourselves, I need to show this person the love of Christ. I have a great and wonderful debt to pay. If you have ever had a personal debt, be it ever so small, you know that the first thing that enters your mind when you see that person is that you owe them. We need to truly see ourselves as spiritual debtors. Wherever we go, whoever we meet, we owe love. This is our debt, loving on that level. We don't love to get something in return. We love because we have been given the greatest love of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In fact, all of the commandments, the guidelines for relating to God and other people point to this reality, that we should be love debtors. A Pharisee asks Jesus what the greatest commandment is in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. We are to reflect the love that is given by Christ, the love that approached the neighbor, the completely different, the broken, the sinful, the far off. This love that lavishes grace upon grace on us and called us into his family. This love that sacrificed itself for us, giving up his life that we might have life. This love does no harm to others, and it invites others into love. In our loving then, we are a beacon to others, a hope and newness of life, and the love they too can have from Christ. Have you ever thought of what would happen in this world if people could be taught how to love as Jesus loves us, and then they did it? 
If we could teach people how to love, we could end violence. If we could love each other, there wouldn't be any more crime. This passage is telling us that the ability to love that and nothing less than that is the radical force that Jesus Christ has turned loose in this world by his resurrection. Therefore, it has the power to radically change the world. Paul implies that this has to start with us. If we are Christians, if we know Jesus, we have the power to love. You don't have to ask for it. You've got it. If you have Jesus, you can act in love, even though you are tempted not to. Therefore, Paul says, when you come up against difficult people, remember that your first obligation is to love them. And Paul also reminds us in this morning's reading that we are not to delay in showing our love for others, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. He is saying we are meant to love as if we can never love enough, and we know the time is short, so let's get on with it. We are to wake up from spiritual lethargy and love our neighbors while we have the opportunity to do so. We need to think of love as a debt we owe to those around us. Are you paying that debt on a consistent basis? Are there people in your life where that debt is growing large? Do something today to get rid of it. Do a random act of kindness or spend some time with them. Whatever it is you need to pay the debt of love. In everything and toward all people, love. Live in love, doing only kindness and help for others rather than harm. The opportunities are all around us every day. The debt one never ceases paying is the call to love one another. We conclude with the prayers of the community. We pray. Lord of light, in the midst of darkness and fear, you call us to be a community of peace, love, and hope. You remind us of the blessings we have and the opportunities to share those blessings with others. We praise and thank you for all these things and for your constant presence with us. We pray for the church that we may continue to find ways to both preach the word and serve our neighbor, especially during this time of separation and crisis. For elected leaders that they may serve with wisdom, compassion, and humility, all the people in their care. For an end to violence in our community, country, and in our world. For all who are on the front lines of this COVID-19 pandemic, especially our healthcare workers and first responders, for all who are unable to stay at home but must work to provide for their families, may God continue to protect them and keep them in good health. For all of us gathered in our homes or wherever we are, that we may find comfort in the Lord when our hearts are troubled and extend that comfort to others whose hearts are also troubled. For all who are struggling with illness, with loss, with feelings of alienation and fear, we pray seeking your healing and hope in their lives. For all the prayers that we hold in the silence of our hearts, for all our intentions, spoken and unspoken. As we have lifted up our concerns, we also offer messages of love and rejoicing. Lord, we thank you for your healing mercies and your sustaining love for us. We are confident in your abiding presence with us. Help us to be faithful to you in all times and in all places. Give us the grace to accept the forgiveness you have offered to each of us. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
So we started the Place at the Table Christmas concert. My husband Bill Studley and I wrote the song A Place at the Table and it's been our theme song for the last 20 years. Yeah, we, yeah we've uh, been uh, raising the money for their uh, Christmas food hampers for the full 20 years. The impact of giving has really changed my life with, you know, helping with that. So they slapped on the cuffs, and jail time was their bluff. I walked away with a $500 fine. Cause it was only two grammars, not enough dope for the slammer. So I kept on cruising down the line. Sue St. Marie, look what you've done to me. Such a shame that we had to meet this way. And I guess I learned my lesson, I suppose I'll count my blessings, but it's safe to say I won't be back again. And when I left the border, my fuse was getting shorter, I went back to the Canadian side of town, hoping things would get better, but the streets were getting wetter, and the Sioux kept on dressing.